so um then we see that there's a kind of template we call this an x-bar theoretic template where um there's a head and that head that's a single word projects into a category into a a phrasal category of with the same label on it so if i'm an n i project an n bar if i'm a p i project a p bar this is minimal stuff at that same level depending on what my meaning is and what other kinds of grammatical constraints are uh, that, that uh, accompany me, I may or may not have a complement. And then that complement will be expressed within that same X bar level. So an N bar if I'm an N, a phrase to my right could be a DP, could be some other kind of, or PP or some other kind of, of phrase depending on what I am. And then um, we can go to a higher level where adjuncts are added and they can be added to the left or the right. We can do this as many times as we want. We can have one or more adjuncts or zero or more adjuncts. You don't need to have any. Um, and these supplement the meaning that you get from the head or the head plus its complement. And then we go to a higher level and now we see that Actually, so far we've only been seeing um, phrase level categories, NP, PP, DP, and so forth, where that phrase level category is expanded only into an X bar level thing. So an NP contains an N bar, a PP contains a P bar, and so forth. But actually we need this higher level in order to incorporate another kind of entity that we call specifier, and which is typically the subject of the phrase, but not always. So we can add the subject in this slot at the highest level within the phrase, where everything else within the phrase will be, depending on the language, either to its right or to its left. In English, the specifier is always to the left in this kind of structure. So let's consider now subjects inside of prepositional phrases. If we um, think of prepositional phrases like this on my team, it's possible to have within them uh, another DP besides the complement my team. So on it's a preposition, it's the head of a prepositional phrase, it has my team as its complement, but it can also have, together with that, the person or individual or entity that's located with respect to my team in the relationship of on. So you on my team has you in the specifier slot of that prepositional phrase. So there's a complement, a subject in the specifier slot, and we can think of on my team as being a predicate. So it has the structure of subject and predicate. Uh, if we look at things like contrastive focus in the pseudo-clef construction, we can find evidence for you on my team, in fact, being a kind of phrasal constituent. So I, what I want is a new car. In this case, we're focusing on a new car, a determiner phrase, constituent of the sentence, I want a new car. Because we can put it in focus in this way, we know that a new car is some kind of a phrasal constituent. Let's take the sentence, I want you on my team. I want you on my team. Want can have a DP as a complement, but it can also have this other kind of structure like you on my team as its complement. So we get, I want you on my team. What I want is you on my team, where we're putting into contrastive focus this entire phrase that includes both the subject, the preposition, and the complement. Similarly with, I need that money in my bank account, we have the same kind of a structure. Need has as its complement a PP, and that PP has within it both the head preposition in and the two 
objects that are being specified as being in the in relationship. My bank account is the place. The stuff that is in that place is that money. So I need that money in my bank account. And I can say what I need is that money in my bank account. Why? Because that money in my bank account is a phrasal constituent, the complement of need. But it's not a DP. It's a prepositional phrase from all we can tell. And then at the same time, you can have things like this. With lots of teamwork, we might win. Without, we'll lose for sure. So here what we've got is a case where with is a preposition that has a DP as its complement with lots of teamwork. And um, if we've already said that, we can create another prepositional phrase using without a little bit later, at which time we leave out the complement entirely. But if we do, we get the interpretation from the complement of with that has already come before. So phrasal constituents can be can undergo ellipsis in this way. Check it out with the case of you on my team. With you on my team, where with is a preposition, the head of a prepositional phrase, that has as its complement you on my team. And you on my team behaves like any other phrasal constituent, any other object of a preposition in this kind of a structure in being able to be left out. But even without, we'll do fine. Without, complement missing, but interpretation gotten from the phrasal constituent that came before. Another kind of case where we get subjects within phrases is verb phrases, where we have things like you playing the drums. You playing the drums isn't a whole sentence, but it is a phrase of some kind as we can see what, if we put it together with want. I want you playing the drums, for example. Or there should be, there should be, what? A person sitting right next to me. Um, or a person sitting right next to her. Or a person sitting next to her. So um, we have another case where we've got um, a verb is the head of some kind of a phrasal constituent, a verb in its ing form, that is to say in its present participle form with the suffix ing, and uh, both a subject and an object. Uh, or I can't stand people watching me eating. Or I can't stand people watching me eat. You could do it either way. But I can't stand people watching me eating has a verb phrase with a subject, me, and a verb eating, me eating, and um, that's the complement of watching in a larger phrase where the subject is people. Watching is the head and the complement is me eating. So people watching me eating is a verb phrase with a subject. And this happens with um, various kinds of verbs that allow this kind of complement. What I want is you playing the drums. Again, we have evidence from the um, contrastive focus construction with, or the pseudoclep construction that shows you contrastive focus, that you playing the drums is a phrasal constituent of some kind. What I really can't stand is people watching me eating. Perfectly good phrasal constituent consisting of um, a verb, a verb phrase headed by watching, its subject is people, its complement is me eating. And that verb phrase has an intransitive verb, eating, and its subject, me, uh, contained within the uh, verb phrase itself. So what about the subjects of clauses? So if we take something like very often study my psychology notes on the bus, that's not a complete sentence. What do I need? I need minimally. I need to have the subject. I very often study my psychology notes on the bus. You very often study your psychology notes on the bus or something like that. So if we zoom in, we can say we can put an I in there 
We have the meaning I, it's a pronoun, is the um, traditional terminology that we use, but in fact, it is better analyzed as a pro-determiner. And um, we give it the category D for determiner, which means that it must be contained within a larger phrase um, of category D bar, and that must be contained within a larger phrase of category DP. There are no adjuncts or complements in this case with this particular determiner. So pronouns are analyzed, we're, being, we're analyzing them as determiners that don't need to have a complement, and in some cases can't even have a complement. Um, and then what else do we need to have to make up a whole sentence? Well, we need to have, minimally, we need to have some kind of inflectional element. And the inflectional element that is absolutely necessary is present tense or past tense, some kind of tense. And we're going to indicate this here with pres for present and put it in brackets. And that means that it's some kind of a, an abstract element that can be manifested in different ways. So present tense is manifested in the verb doesn't if it's a third person singular subject if it's if it's not then the verb is realized as don't the present tense itself doesn't have a separate um, piece that we can point to but it's nevertheless there you can always tell when uh, a sentence is in the present tense form or the past tense form so here we have the verb do which is an auxiliary verb so auxiliary verbs can be added to sentences, and when they are, they're the ones that are going to take, they're going to the ones that are going to combine with the other um, inflectional morphology. So present tense plus unt, meaning not, are uh, the affixal inflectional morphology that's here. That, that combines with the verb do to give us because of allomorphy, the form don't. Allomorphy and, um, and alternation. So this is an alternation between do and do. Do shows up with unt. That's the form of do that shows up in that case. So we've got, um, in, at, the, at the base of every sentence, we have an inflectional head, a part that counts as the head of the whole sentence, and we give that the label I um, to stand for, short for inflection. And the inflection is, at some level, the head of the whole sentence. When there's an auxiliary verb, then that inflection shows up as part of some kind of morphological, a morphological manifestation of that on the um, auxiliary verb. So then we have the subject that combines with a predicate, just like we have in all kinds of phrases at the sentence level. And the, the predicate that it, it combines with is a subphrase that's projected from the inflectional head, inflectional head being given the label I here. So then the entire phrase is simply following the, um, the constraints and the rules of X-bar theory, if the head of the whole structure is an inflectional element, I, then the whole phrase itself, a sentence being a kind of a phrase, is an inflectional phrase, or IP.